Okay, uh, welcome to the part seven of the International Christian University Colloquium, as known as ICU Link. I'm Sung Hun Lee from ICU. The topic of ICU Link this season is African linguistics, and today we have two talks by Dr. Chris Green from Syracuse University and Dr. She Olusheye Adesola from Yale University. Let me introduce the first speaker. Chris is an assistant professor of linguistics at Syracuse University. He specializes in prosody phonology, the phonology morphology interface, and field linguistics. And uh, he worked on many different African languages, including Mande, Kushtik, Dogon, Jarawan, and other Bantu languages in East Africa. Uh, he uh, looked at also like Luya, spoken in Kenya and Uganda. Yeah. I think uh, his Somali grammar must be out now. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, please uh, rush to the uh, Amazon store to get the Somali <laughs> grammar written by uh, our Chris Green. <laughs> and he has numer uh, written numerous articles on uh, various aspects of phonological uh, theories, uh, including but not limited to syllable structure, prosodic structure, tone, and what is a word uh, in these languages, which also relates to like the, the dog's question about what is the word. And, uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, we first met at an ACL conference, I think uh, somewhere in the South <laughs> and Georgia. in Georgia, yes. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I remember that. And um, uh, his work has been uh, uh, exciting uh, because of the uh, new data he was addressed and also uh, his analysis was uh, giving a, a lot of new insights into multiple phenomenon that uh, we were uh, that have been known but not fully uh, uncovered. So it's good to have you here uh, at ICU Link. Today, Chris will talk about the mistaken identity of the Jarawa who traveled north toward a reclassification of Zarawan Bantu. All right, great. Thank you so much. I'll let's see, share my screen. Yeah. Say, so, yeah, let uh, turn off the video so uh, uh, we don't show up on the video. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So yeah, thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to uh, to join you to uh, today and to um, to share a bit about my ongoing project on Jar One languages. Um, as uh, Professor Lee just mentioned, I'm primarily a phonologist, but um, this project that I've been working on for the past several years um, has taken me uh, into uh, areas that I hadn't really thought of too much before, in, including uh, uh, historical connections or the bearing that the data that I'm uncovering have on um, historical um, issues and, and ongoing debates, including classification. And so um, kind of a, an unusual title here, but it will, uh, uh, I hope it'll make some more sense as we go along, so. So the plan for today is to tell you a little bit about Jarwan languages. Um, they're not really well known or well represented in the literature at all. Um, I'll tell you a bit about why these languages are uh, so interesting to not only linguists, but also historians um, and anthropologists among others. I will tell you about the classification deba debate um, concerning Jarwan languages and um, namely whether they are properly classified within uh, Bantu or narrow Bantu as we often call it, or as Bantoid non-Bantu. And so in order to uh, inform this discussion, we are going to look at new data, but also uh, consider a reanalysis of some old data. And we will look at lexical cognacy sound changes and morphology, both in the nominal and the verbal domains. And then I'll tell you about the title. Okay, so to start off with um, the Jarwan languages, there's about 20 or so languages, depending on how you count and who you ask. Um, there's a, uh, an issue here of so-called hill Jarawa versus plain Jarawa. Uh, so that has played into the confusion about these languages uh, over time. The hill Jarawa are actually plateau languages, so they're entirely different from the languages that I will uh, be talking about. So here uh, is where they are located, uh, primarily in Bauchi State, Nigeria. Um, but also um, over uh, the, the border into Plateau State, Taraba State, um, and thereabouts. Um, 
Jarwan languages um, are in a bit of a precarious linguistic situation in Nigeria. So as we all know, the official language of Nigeria is English. Uh, we have uh, three large um, uh, regional lingua francas. So Jar Jarwan languages are spoken in kind of Hausa land, uh, but Jar Jarwan people are predominantly um, Christian. And so there's a lot of kind of competing pressures there on, um, on these languages. Um, there, uh, a survey that was done by SIL back in the late 2000s um, determined that none of these languages really have kind of a healthy um, situation of language maintenance. Uh, they're uh, threatened by, um, by Hausa in particular, also English. And so um, if you zoom into different clusters, there's different levels of endangerment going on. Um, in addition to this uh, cluster of languages in, in uh, kind of eastern Nigeria, there um, are known to be two Jarwan languages that were spoken in Cameroon, but these are now believed uh, to be extinct um, based on what's reported by, uh, in several works by Roger Blench uh, from a few years ago. Um, Another thing that has contributed to uh, why we don't know too terribly much about these languages is that there's some logistical difficulties of doing in situ data collection in this area. It's kind of rough terrain. Uh, and so not, not a lot of folks go out um, that way to do data collection. And so uh, all this has culminated in the fact that until uh, recently, um, only one descriptive paper about JAR1 uh, had had been out there, uh, a paper about uh, verbal extensions by uh, Ludwig Gerhardt in 1988. So one of the puzzles uh, about Jarwin languages is where they belong in the classificatory record, uh, whether or not they are narrow Bantu or if they're Bantoid non-Bantu. And this has been uh, well debated uh, going back to uh, about the 1920s uh, thereabouts. Um, so uh, if you look at this map here, what this shows, uh, this map that uh, I, I have um, adapted from Kuhn Bastun's 2018 paper on the Bantu expansion, is we have the Bantu homeland uh, indicated in A up here. And uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, Bantu uh, uh, peoples uh, migrated uh, south and east um, over some period of time. But uh, here's where uh, our Nigerian ban or Jarwan languages are up here in the green, and those two, um, two uh, Cameroonian Jarwan languages uh, are indicated uh, in the area where the blue star is. So um, there's a lot of interest in this Bantu expansion about what it tells us about um, kind of the movement of people, um, why Bantu people um, moved um, so so quickly and so far. Um, all at once is, you know, an outstanding question. So, um, you know, when it comes to these Jarwan languages, um, they're interesting because they do have some cognates um, with Bantu languages, but they are clearly spoken outside and in the opposite direction of other Bantu languages. Um, what's interesting, uh, it was uh, pointed out to me uh, by my colleague, uh, Rebecca Grohlmund, that um, Dmitry Idiotov and Mark Vandeveld uh, published a paper not too long ago that proposes a so-called new Bantu homeland uh, that's actually uh, up here, uh, right around the area where this blue star is in, in Cameroon, uh, based, uh, they based this determination on the distribution of the labiovelar consonants. So this is kind of interesting and might play into uh, you know, what, what uh, we find on these languages. So why has there been so, so much a disagreement? Well, um, uh, as I said, there's very little linguistic work that has been done on these languages. Um, the data that is available isn't entirely usable. Um, there are word lists out there for a lot of these languages, um, but they range from a couple dozen words to about 400 words. Um, and they are scattered about a, a lot of times in um, uh, difficult to, to get, um, get a hold of uh, resources, um, unpublished, um, long ago published. Um, sometimes the data in them are difficult to interpret. For example, um, there are morphologically complex forms that um, folks who didn't know um, about the grammar didn't know that they were morphologically complex. So they were kind of theorizing and class, uh, making classifications based on this. And we now know that um, there's, there's more to the story. Um, I mentioned uh, SIL's survey 
of these languages that was done in the late 2000s. So there are raw recordings that exist for some of these languages and um, SIL has recently and very graciously uh, gifted them uh, to me to use for scholarly purposes. So um, those are uh, being processed uh, by, by me and by my students. Um, importantly though, there are no uh, available descriptions, grammars, dictionaries, or anything for any of these languages. So that has kind of uh, hindered um, more um, linguistic work on them. Um, there is also a sizable degree of borrowing from Chadic languages and mainly from Hausa. So um, these languages in a way kind of uh, fell into my lap uh, for, for lack of a better term. I had a student who um, joined us at Syracuse University to pursue her MA, and she told me she was a speaker of a German language. I didn't know what they were, and the, the world has, uh, or my familiarity with them has expanded since then. We have been working, uh, Milka too and I have been working since 2018 on describing, documenting these languages. Um, so the data that I base uh, what I'll talk about today on is um, uh, collected uh, in New York, but also in Nigeria. Uh, so um, we did some questionnaires and some narratives were collected um, in Nigeria by Amilka back in late 2019 uh, before uh, the world went crazy. Um, and we have been working remotely since that time with speakers of two other languages, Duguri and Galumkia. Our focus has been on Mbat, um, which was or is uh, Milka's mother tongue. And as I said, we've done some other expansion more recently. For Mbat, uh, to give you an idea of where we are, we have about a 2000 headword lexicon and we have 50 recorded narratives and personal stories, songs. Um, 15 of these are fully glossed and analyzed. And so uh, what I'm gonna be presenting on also reflects ongoing collaboration with uh, Professor Rebecca Grohlund, who is uh, at the University of Missouri. Okay, so turning to classifications, um, Jarwin languages were first mentioned um, in, by a linguist uh, in Coella uh, 1854. So we've known about Jarwin languages for quite some time. Um, there have been a lot of descriptive and classificatory surveys done. I list just a few of them here. Um, Interestingly, in these earlier classifications, um, and here's a quote from Johnson, were not its grammar much worn down and deprived of Bantu features, it might well be rated a Bantu tongue. So uh, early on, um, it was recognized that there's uh, some, uh, perhaps some cognacy uh, to Bantu languages, but there's some um, unusual things about these languages, as we'll see, uh, they uh, lack a noun class system, which we all know is very uh, well known uh, feature of, of Bantu languages. Um, later works, uh, as we got uh, into the 1980s and 1990s, uh, these works highlighted the cognacy with um, Proto-Bantu and pointed toward the so-called Greenberg crab criteria that these, um, their uh, noun class prefixes that uh, we'll see are fossilized contain nasals. And so um, it was long thought that this was a um, important uh, piece of evidence in favor of classification as Narabantu. But um, since that time, um, uh, the suitability of that metric for inclusion of Bantu has been challenged, um, notably uh, by Larry Hyman, who um, points out that these um, uh, nasal prefixes are found uh, outside of Narabantu and notably in, in Grassfield's languages, and so they can't necessarily be a defining characteristic of Narabantu. Um, so the uh, classification of uh, Bent or if, if, of Jarwin languages themselves, the internal classification that, that um, we have been working uh, with is uh, based on Madison and Williamson. Um, they take no strong stance on whether these languages are uh, Bantu versus Bantoi, but they point uh, towards a close affinity between the two groups um, that needs further investigation. Most recently, however, um, there have been um, extensive comparisons done and work that has been based on advances in um, lexical statistics and other computational modeling uh, methods um, that place Jarwan uh, uh, alongside the Bambubi languages, which are the um, within Northwest Bantu and specifically within Bantu A31, A40, A60. Um, so this is kind of an interesting uh, outcome here. 
This is based on um, sound changes uh, within cognates, but it only focuses on the core lexicon. And within the core lexicon, there's about 40% uh, cognacy. So you might think that that's pretty uh, good evidence for, um, for this connection. Well, as we'll see, um, there, there's more to that story. Um, so in order to continue on to uh, the real uh, core of this uh, presentation, I wanted to give you um, just a little idea of kind of where we're situating ourselves and where these languages are within the broader classificatory scheme. Uh, we are going to be concerned, uh, I'll mention um, uh, reconstructions of proto benue Congo, so you can see out here, um, but also uh, within Bantoid languages, we're going to be mostly concerned down here with this branch of Southern Bantoid versus Bantu, and essentially where Jarwin languages kind of articulate or fit within this um, uh, classificatory divide. Okay, so uh, in order to do that, we are going to look um, at cognacy, at sound changes, and at um, nominal and verbal morphology. Okay, so looking at cognacy, as I said, um, much of the work that has been uh, devoted to um, figuring out uh, or, or proposing a classification uh, for JAR1 has been based on cognacy. Well, uh, work that Rebecca and I are doing right now um, uh, has revealed that most cognates shared by Jarwan and Proto-Bantu are also reconstructed for um, uh, or older groups such as proto grass fields based on Larry Hyman's uh, reconstruction and even for proto Benway Congo uh, based on DeWolf's uh, reconstruction uh, back in the 1970s. Um, obviously, there's a lot of these I could show you, but I just uh, pulled some here for you where you can see um, Bot and Dugri are two languages that I've collected data on personally, so I wanted to highlight those. We can see here that yes, there's certainly cognacy um, between Jarwan and Proto Bantu, but also here you can see this um, word is shared in Proto Benue Congo. Here, uh, the word for a uh, bite, regular sound change where uh, uh, Jarwan has an N a word initially. We have a D in Proto Bantu. Here we can see this loom is uh, reconstructed for Proto grass fields, uh, so on and so forth here with the term for belly very clearly shared among all, um, uh, similar to what we saw for stone. We see that both in Proto-Bantu and proto benue Congo, uh, there's a cognate there. And then for uh, fat or oil, a slightly different story, uh, but you can clearly see uh, we have this, um, this coronal stop here. Um, and then we have jar one has this kind of moo um, prefix that has um, been, been developed and um, then thereafter um, fossilized. So um, interestingly, um, what this tells us is that these shared cognates between Jarwan Bantu or Jarwan and Bantu may be inherited from an earlier proto language such as Proto Benue Congo. And that would tell us that rather than being shared lexical innovations, they are shared retentions from that earlier language. In fact, in um, our uh, extensive search um, across the lexicon, there are no lexical innovations that we have been able to uncover that are specific to uh, JAR1 and, and Bantu. So that uh, we uh, feel is very significant. Um, what's interesting uh, to point out, though, I think, is that if we step behind or beyond that core lexicon I mentioned um, to an expanded lexicon of about 400 or so items, uh, the cognacy between Jarwan and uh, Bantu or Proto-Bantu specifically decreases from 40% to 20%. Okay, moving on to sound changes. Um, so alongside cognacy, a lot of uh, what, what has been motivated about the classification has to do with, um, with sound changes. So uh, in work that Rebecca uh, Grohlman and Gerard Philipson are doing, uh, they discuss the fact that in Northwest Bantu languages, so all of those uh, kind of group A um, uh, Bantu languages, um, when you compare those languages to uh, Proto-Bantu, um, or reconstructions of proto Bantu. The I, what what uh, they propose is that proto K uh, uh, went away, whereas proto G um, turned into K. 
specifically within the Mambubi languages that uh, Jarwan are uh, purportedly uh, most similar to these 30, 40, 60 languages. Um, some of these languages uh, exhibit the same uh, correspondences, but others actually exhibit uh, something quite different where proto K remains K and proto G is the one that has, um, that, uh, has been lost. Interestingly, based on uh, our uh, current research on Jarwan languages, we find that Jarwan languages did not exhibit either pattern with the exception of five words. So um, there's always going to be exceptions, I think. But um, generally speaking, uh, they don't exhibit either pattern. We see that um, proto-K is retained, but proto-G uh, turns into K, so we have a, a merger. Um, in both these instances, any of these Ks when uh, following a nasal um, turn into a G, that's not um, all that surprising. But as I said, there's an apparent merger in Jarwan um, that we don't see in any of these other clades. And therefore, this is perhaps um, evidence of an innovative sound change that could define Jarwan on its own. Okay. So we've talked about cognacy, we've talked about sound changes, but then we will now turn to nominal morphology. Um, so Jarwan languages have no synchronically productive noun class system. They don't have agreement or concord, anything like that. But there is evidence that there was a system in place historically. Um, as Madison and Williamson mentioned in their 1975 classification, these prefixes appear to be frozen. Um, so um, I think it's well known that proto benue Congo and even proto Niger Congo um, are, are, are um, assumed to have had productive and sizable noun class systems. So, just to give you an example here, a smattering of nouns, uh, singular and plural nouns in Jarwan, you can see in all instances, nouns of different shapes and sizes um, that are countable have the same um, plural prefix, this high tone B uh, prefix. Um, uh, so you can do that comparison across. Um, the only exceptions that we find to this, as might be expected, have to do with mass nouns, abstract nouns, or other uncountables that we wouldn't um, expect to have plurals anyway. Um, and there are also six so-called corporate nouns uh, that can be interpreted as singular or plural, but take no plural morphology. Um, these all have to do with body parts. Um, just so uh, in case you might think, okay, maybe there's some kind of agreement or concord that's revealed in other contexts. Um, I have some examples here to show that um, this simple opposition between singular and plural is reflected in agreement. So we see here, uh, mom is woman, and we see ma and uh, this mia uh, definite. We have this agreement in the singular. And then for our uh, simple uh, plural prefix b, we have ba and bia. So we have agreement there um, in, in that uh, very uh, simple way. Uh, this also uh, occurs in predications. So I've kind of separated out this relative clause here, but you can see but, um, man, and you can see um, singular agreement on is tall, magulan. And uh, when we pluralize man here, we see that we have agreement for the plural reflected uh, again in on the um, predicate adjective. So uh, nothing unusual happening there. So all this to show you that Jarwin's historical noun class system has clearly been lost. Um, unlike the vast majority of Bantu languages and even most um, other languages in Southern Bantoid and indeed the Grassfield languages, um, these languages have robust uh, noun class systems, are very productive, they have concordial systems. Um, interestingly, though, um, some Eastern Grassfield languages, and they, the, uh, specifically the geographically easternmost of them, um, have these uh, more reduced systems that are collapsing in the direction of a, sing uh, a singular plural um, divide. Uh, this is also found in northern Bantoid languages like Tikar, where there's a reduced system. So the question is, how has this come to be and why? Uh, there's a really uh, wonderful paper by Jeff Good from 2012 about how to become a qua noun uh, that um, entertains some possibilities. So um, I'd encourage you to uh, take a look at that if you're not familiar with it. Um, I also want to show, uh, since we're on the topic of nouns here, um, there are uh, instances of cognacy um, in noun class prefixes, um, despite them being frozen in Jarwan. Um, 
they, uh, there are cognates with Proto-Bantu, but also with some of these earlier reconstructions. So we have Proto-Bantu here. Uh, this is Proto-Eastern grass fields, uh, Proto-Momo ring, uh, which is sometimes called Western grass fields. And then here is Proto-Benway Congo. And then here is our Mbat uh, to represent Jarwan. Uh, as you can see, we have Mu, Mu, Mun, Mu, Mu, Mut. Um, I include this Mu in question mark uh, with a question mark here because um, Larry Hyman discusses in his 1980 paper about um, uh, grass field reconstruction that it's likely the case the eastern grass field was originally uh, Mu for these prefixes. Uh, but you can scan down here Ma, 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 Mus. Ki, 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 kun. Uh, there's a, a nasal prefix here, 910. Uh, class 15, ku, ku, kit. And then uh, down here, we can see class 8, which is the uh, jar one plural class that is cognate across the board. So, one thing to, to point out notably is that. Um, Jarwan may have uh, an, a shared innovation with Proto Momo Ring, or as I said, Western grass fields for class seven. Uh, you can see here that there's a high tone uh, shared uh, uh, on this noun class prefix that seems to be a representative uh, or represented, excuse me, in Jarwan. Um, Jarwan has also adopted class eight as its general plural. And this is interesting because elsewhere in grass fields, uh, there uh, are mergers such that there are kind of general plural classes. So in Eastern grass fields, uh, class two or six. Uh, in, in Western grass fields, classes uh, 10 and 13 are often general plurals. But there's also um, work showing that um, in Eastern grass fields, class two and eight are merging together. So kind of uh, reflecting something similar to what appears to uh, happen in, uh, at least in Bot. Um, Turning uh, to verbal morphology, um, the vast majority of jar one verbs are monosyllabic, uh, though there is a small class of disyllabic stems and I'll focus on the disyllabic ones. So uh, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that that one paper that was out there on jar one languages was by Gerhardt here. And that was uh, indeed on its verbal morphology. And I've uh, published uh, two papers um, more recently about verbal morphology. Um, in these papers, what's discussed is basically the only productive affixation that you find in these languages, which is found in the uh, habitual and perfective uh, extensions, to use Gerhardt's term. Um, uh, we see that the habitual does appear to be related to proto-bantu ang, which is the repetitive um, or imperfect in some languages, I think, synchronically. Um, the perfective appears related to proto-bantu mat, uh, the verb meaning to finish. Uh, this is uh, raised in uh, by Larry Hyman in a, a paper in 2018. But um, any other tense aspect mood um, uh, morphology is encoded by pre-verbal um, articles and um, auxiliaries. And there is essentially no derivational morphology on, um, on verbs. Uh, very similar to what we see uh, in the nominal system with fossilization of morphology, uh, it appears that we have fossilized extensions as well. And this is what is found in this smaller class of disyllabic verb stems. There are um, seemingly unproductive extensions that um, are remnants of old valency enhancing or decreasing uh, extensions or action orientation type of pluractional uh, morphology um, that um, appear to be uh, derived from what was uh, reconstructed for proto niger congo um, based on a work that Larry Hyman has, has done. Um, there is uh, analogous loss and or fossilization that is noted in Bantu languages by both Larry Hyman and Roger Blench. Um, this uh, loss and fossilization occurs to various uh, degrees. But the, interestingly, in, in Jarwan is the process of fossilization appears to be complete. Um, also, uh, the extensions that are found in our current database of Mbot are all and only those that are uh, reconstructed for proto grass fields and presumably proto bantoid. Um, and you can see uh, those, those forms. Um, and I should uh, I point out that they're not equally distributed. Um, so, to give you an idea of what this looks like, just checking the time. Um, 
here are a few uh, representative examples from this uh, from this list. Um, in our database of about 400 verbs, there's only about 34 of these. And so you can see here that um, uh, forms involving this vowel S, vowel T, vowel K, vowel L, vowel M, vowel N um, are not equally distributed. Uh, we have quite a few representatives of the first four, but um, for the um, M, uh, the vowel M uh, frozen suffix, we have just three, and there's only one uh, that I've found that has an N. And so uh, based on the discussion in uh, the uh, papers I cited a moment ago uh, by Larry Hyman, here are some of the possible ways that we could see uh, this, um, these suffixes relating to uh, these um, you know, kind of proto functions. Um, some of them are uh, difficult to, to figure out without, more, um, with, without any more examples. But interestingly, we see in some instances that there uh, is perhaps some uh, kind of construal of valency enhancing um, uh, function historically, but a lot of it has to do with pluractionality or kind of action orientation. Um, we have contactive, iterative, um, separative, things like that. Um, and um, as uh, predicted uh, in Larry's work, um, with um, in most instances, um, these verbs don't occur without their fossilized extension. So it's really hard to kind of say something more concretely about what their function may have been. So, um, you know, how and why these extensions are lost or fossilized is, uh, you know, an uh, uh, ongoing question. But um, uh, Hyman has, uh, on several occasions, discussed um, uh, the consequences of morphological changes, kind of uh, the creation of, of templates. Uh, that needed to be kind of adhered to that contributed to um, morphological loss. Um, all of the um, outcomes of, of these uh, changes um, would uh, apply to Jarwan, and I'm happy to talk about these in the question answer. Uh, we are kind of starting to run a little bit uh, low on time. But uh, importantly here, you know, what do these outcomes reveal about Jarwin classification? Well, uh, in short, it's another way that Jarwin languages appear to differ from Bantu, or another way they resemble Bantoid, non-Bantu languages. Here, I think, is what is, is really uh, incredible, is uh, Hyman proposes a three-stage transition um, uh, from synthenticity uh, to analicity. And the idea here is that um, uh, at stage one, um, uh, morphology is primarily uh, valency oriented. At stage two, these, um, uh, these morphemes start to take on a primarily aspectual uh, orientation. And at stage three, they become entirely aspectual. And so uh, Hyman proposes that Proto-Bantu was at stage one. Bantu group A is somewhere between stage one and two and bantoid are between stage two and three. And so what it would seem to be is that Jarwan languages have become entirely aspectual, if not beyond in their, their fossilization. And if we um, equate this to time depth, this might tell us something about just uh, where these Jarwan languages might fit um, in the classificatory record. Anyway. So if Jarwan languages uh, are Bantoid, non-Bantu languages and not Narrow-Bantu, where do they belong uh, uh, relative to other languages in this group? Um, are they closer to Bantu than grass fields or not? So this um, uh, classification here is based on um, what Rebecca Groman and her colleagues proposed in 2018. Um, which uh, this is the same one as earlier. You can see here the Jarwan group next to um, Bambubi. Um, so there's some really interesting things to, to look at in this regard. Um, one of them, um, Rebecca and I were really intrigued to find uh, the case of the word for tail, which we found in Jarwan uh, is in Gili, Gil, Gila, Gile, um, in uh, the reconstruction for Proto-Bantu is Keda. And we saw that there was no reflex of this in grass fields, which uh, is reconstructed as kun. So we thought, wow, maybe this is the one shared innovation that we can find. 
But then we went digging a little bit further and we see that in Proto-Benway Congo, there is Kila uh, for this word. And even in Ekoid and Tevoid, we have Kel in Ki. So if we look at where that um, might um, lead us to, um, Tivoid, ecoid are um, articulated above grass fields. And so uh, this makes us um, wonder whether Jarwan is articulated um, there as well. So here is um, the uh, new um, classification that Rebecca and I are entertaining. This is still a work in progress. So, um, so watch this space. So with all that in mind and with our um, uh, arguments uh, or in, in uh, for Jarwin being Bantoid non-Bantu ver versus narrow Bantu, uh, I get to the issue of the title. Um, this is actually the third uh, paper given uh, that kind of is a riff on this idea of mistaken identity. So the, the first one of these was in Stall Cup 1980, um, the Guthrie criteria in Batu of Moldamo, the mistaken identity of the Bantus who stayed home. And so the idea here with Stall Cup or for Stall Cup, I should say, is that grass fields languages, um, he says, are uh, properly classified as Bantu. Um, they align with um, Guthrie's Bantu criteria for the most part. So they um, are mistakenly treated as something different, but they're properly Bantu. Well, then Gerhardt, uh, the same Gerhardt as 1988, in 1982, wrote a paper, Jarwin Bantu, the mistaken identity of the Bantu who turned north. So pretty clear that he felt that they were Bantu. So he says that Jarwin speakers are Bantu and they, for some unknown reason, turned north while others dispersed to the southeast. Well, in the case here, uh, my argument would be that, yes, it seems that Jarwin speakers have some common ancestry with grassfields and Bantu, but they traveled north independently. And so this actually, uh, I, I've uh, started uh, digging in the historical record, and I have been uh, talking with Constance Weiss, who is a um, Africanist historian at Eastern Tennessee State University, and she pointed me towards some very interesting literature um, where uh, historians, uh, historians argue that um, Jarwan peoples um, traveled north fairly recently, somewhere between 1700 and 1750, due to a series of droughts in the uh, Benway Basin, and um, Although the precise um, origin uh, of, of uh, these peoples is in question, it seems pretty clear that there is a recent pluri-ethnic omnidirectional uh, exodus in waves. And so um, the idea being that there is perhaps one wave of people that kind of left a bit early uh, and, and went along one path and another that um, left and went along the Benway River in particular. So um, we're, th that's also a work in progress, but um, it's a, quite an intriguing possibility. So with that, I'll thank you and I'll take any questions. Thank you. So now it's uh, time for question <coughs> and comments. We'll wait while Chris finishes his water. <laughs> oh. Actually, I have a clarification. Uh, not yeah, clarification. I'm not that familiar with the uh, uh, 2018 Heimann where uh, he talks about the yeah. what was uh, the aspects and uh, can we go to the slide and yes, um, yeah. So the historical me... stages of. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. So this uh, balance versus aspect. So, do we see this kind of like? Uh, it's interesting because yesterday at uh, another talk, uh, not violence aspect, but like uh, the historical change of the morphosyntactic construction was uh, seen as a like switch, and people said like, well, how how do you? What's the evidence for switch of the mm -hmm. uh, membership, especially from a, uh, a little uh, prefix or like suffix uh, that happens? But yeah, in this yeah. particular case, can you uh, just enlighten us a little bit about uh, uh, what? Yeah, so um, I can say yeah, why he came up with this idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, uh, let me think here. So 
the idea was that um, you know the uh, proto language uh, had um, more morphology, and then over time there were um, templatic uh, requirement or um, kind of constraints, let's say, um, on word shape, and so that uh, caused um, morphemes to erode. Um, uh, at the edge, and in order to um, in order to kind of make up for uh, the inability for these morphemes to be expressed, um, other um, other mechanisms were were developed in terms of like serial verb constructions and. Uh, the um, creation of prepositional phrases and uh, things along those lines to kind of compensate for this loss in, in morphology. And so um, the, the idea is that, you know, in, in the proto language, you know, there was all this morphology that was kind of primarily, you know, valency oriented. So, you know, uh, causatives, passives, so on and so forth, um, that, you know, maybe uh, there was some aspectual um, function involved in them. Um, over time, it appears to be if we look at the Bantu A languages that that um, began to change uh, and to, to the extent that a lot of the morphology started to take on more aspectual, um, the, I guess the causative, I, I think it was fairly persistent, but it took on um, kind of more aspectual functions, a lot, a lot to do with um, pluractionality and kind of action um, orientation. And so um, Hyman, you know, talks about the Bantoid languages kind of falling, uh, you know, more in that direction, uh, kind of being primarily aspectual on their way to being uh, entirely aspectual. Um, but it seems to, to be in the case of Jarwin, I didn't want to go beyond the stage. But in these instances, it's really hard for us to really say for sure what these frozen um, extensions um, had done, right? Um, so we kind of have to extract out, um, you know, what they might have done. But what seems to be the case is that they're entirely fr uh, frozen um, in, in JAR1, uh, presumably, you know, with their mostly aspectual function in place. Um, but again, there's, there's no productivity in, in the morphology, so it's really hard to say. So the uh, valence changing uh, suffixes are non-existing anymore uh, in this language. That, you use a that's sort of, correct. Uh, yeah, a syntactic only... construction for expressing passive, for example. Or... Yeah, there's there's nothing like that whatsoever. There's there's no valency. Uh, there's no valency enhancing or um, or decreasing morphology and verbs. The only um, the only morphology is that habitual uh, and the perfective. Um, uh, extensions that Gerhardt mentioned and I've written out about uh, a bit as well. So they don't have applicative uh, suffix or, or no applicative, no. And passive, nothing. They uh, for applicatives, um, they they have a, a kind of a, a an oblique type of um, uh, preposition phrase. Preposition, phrases. yeah, preposition. Uh, so. There's three different, oh goodness, I have to think all of a sudden here, uh, three different prepositions. There's a um, kind of a generic um, kind of comative instrumental with, so a multi or a polyfunctional there. There's um, this B um, uh, and there's also a, a, a locative, like a general locative, but those are the only three prepositions that we see. Um, any other, um, kind of TAM, as I mentioned, um, is these preverbal particles. Mm -hmm. um, they're kind of, they look a bit like auxiliaries. We have ba and sa, which is kind of, uh, kind of the kind of present auxiliary, future auxiliary. And we have uh, the one thing that it does look kind of bantu is we have key, like the persistive key. Mm -hmm. But um, beyond that, the there's another one, uh, Bach. Uh, that is kind of sits on either side of the subject, um, mm -hmm. and that um, kind of encodes kind of used to do. But mm -hmm. that's about it. Yeah, very, uh, very, very different system. Mm. And that system is more uh, in 
uh, available in the neighboring language is found in neighboring language, right? I, yeah, I think it, it's more uh, it's more similar to you know what occurs in other you know uh, grass fields or yeah, southern Bantu languages in general. Yeah. yeah. Does uh, uh, anyone have another question? I have more actually, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, again the Hyman 2018, but like uh, does he mention any other language group or like other type of language that underwent a similar type of changes or is it purely based on the... I mean, the, the papers, uh, so there was a, a, I think it was John Waters volume on, um, Proto Benue Congo. And so Larry has a couple of different papers in there. Um, uh, and one of them is about this idea of, you know, how, how this kind of change in, in the morphology occurred. So the focus is um, on those languages. I'd be uh, very, very happy to send you the PDF. Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks. Another question that I had was about the uh, classification of Jarawan. Like, I'm not, uh, I think it's interesting that uh, uh, your, your uh, revised story about instead of like having uh, moved just for uh, uh, like, oh, we fought and like we moved that uh, we moved north, other moved southeast, that kind mm -hmm. of narrative can often uh be seen as we were different we were special kind of narrative <laughs> in the sense but uh like the uh i think it makes much more sense this uh uh the pluralistic what did you call it the exodus <laughs> story yeah, yeah i mean this is all i mean it's really um a, a fascinating uh, historical story now of course i'm not i'm no historian but um that's why we reached out to professor weiss and um some of the uh discussions uh even in the kind of literature of uh i think they're kind of historians who do linguistics rather than historical linguists i, I guess you might say and mm -hmm. there's a lot of this discussion about these um different waves of people and just kind of the the time depth is a very is really fascinating i think um you know when we think about kind of the you know uh bantu expansion um you know, when it comes to Jarwan, the, the history, the, the depth of the history is, is very shallow, right? So they're talking about, you know, 1700s. Um, so the, the idea um, is, um, if you look at the kind of clusters of uh, Jarwan uh, peoples, you have the uh, uh, Mboa, that are kind of at where this Ingarua in northern Cameroon, where I, I guess kind of the nucleus is, is proposed. The Nagumi was this group that moves south, but the rest of Jarawan is kind of up in these little clusters um, along different rivers in, in Nigeria. And so um, the idea is that um, one uh, group, uh, one migration uh, went north along the Benue River and got to Numan, and there's the Bula Boza cluster, and then uh, they continued on down into the Workum Hills, and that's where you find the Kulum cluster, and then the dispersal was north, and that's where the Jar cluster is, which is um, Batan du uh, Duguri, the languages that, that I've worked on um, are up there. There's another uh, kind of cluster that is on the Gongola River, um, kind of uh, north. And um, this is um, languages like um, uh, what they call it, the uh, Jaku cluster, Jaku um, and um, Labi or Shiki, uh, a couple of different languages. And those um, it, from based on what um, the SIL survey folks uh, mentioned is they weren't able to find speakers of those languages. So it's really difficult to kind of say what was going on up there because I don't think there's a lot of, of, of those um, speakers uh, that remain. I have a, a follow up question related to your comment about uh, uh, the Hyman 2018. Uh, I think uh, if I'm not uh, misheard, uh, you said the neighboring languages 
had also a similar kind of aspect oriented uh, oriented system. And uh, if uh, that's the case, uh, how bad is it <laughs> to think that uh, Jaruan somehow uh, uh, the Jaruan system is induced by contact with the neighboring languages? Uh, uh, I, think, I, I don't um, know. I don't know the interrelationship there, so it's just a pure speculation at this point. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's um. So the, I guess the one thing to point out is the idea of the neighboring languages. I think kind of neighboring. Um, kind of from a classification standpoint, I don't know the right geographic, uh, geographic, Geogra I mean, geographic. Yeah. That's the thing. Geographically, you've got plateau, Adamawa languages, you've got Hausa, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I don't know that we can say that you know what what what, what they're doing. Um, I haven't looked at um. The plateau languages um, or, or Chadic, so I can't really speak to that. Um, I think the contact that the effective contact that has been uh, discussed is really on the lexicon rather than on the grammar. Um, this is why I've been really intrigued by um, you know the, this you know this whole project is so much has been done focused specifically on the lexicon and on cognacy and very little has been um, discussed when it comes to grammar, primarily because we didn't know much about Jarwin grammar. And so it's, it's hard to say quite yet. Um, I haven't gone digging yet to see what some of these comparisons are. Um, I've kind of started, uh, you know, with with um, morphology. And so that's, you know, we started looking, you know, for the, the, the prefixes, the extensions, and kind of have seen these parallels based on um, the work that's been done on other um, Bantuan languages, but I've not yet gotten beyond that into these um, kind of higher um, classificatory groups such as Tevoid, Ecoid, um, and even further out like Plateau, which would be, you know, quite, quite a bit further removed. Yeah, which I think is really nice because uh, cognacy has its own limit. It's a good starting point. I think it has its yeah. own limit because if you just look at cognates between, let's say, Chinese and Korean, you say 60% of the words are cognates, actually. So then will you say that these two languages are related or were related at one point? And nobody says that. Uh, and in your case, it was like 40%. Uh, so. Yeah. If you use that criteria, it's uh, it can raise more questions than give us an answer. Uh, yeah. so moving on and to I mean, there's a limitation of the data yeah. set too, right? Yeah, like but, the, yeah. the methodology saying, yeah. okay, if we're only looking, and I, and I I don't know, I can't recall the precise numbers, but if you're looking at a hundred words, somewhere between ninety-two and a hundred and some odd words, depending on who is doing the you know the calculation. But if you're only looking at that and you're talking about this core lexicon, well, okay, that that skews things a bit. So if mm -hmm. if it's about the methodology, you're always going to end up with them sitting in that spot next to these other languages, right? And so that's why it's just, I think it's remarkable that when you step outside um, to that larger lexicon, that everything drops to 20%, right? Right, right. Uh, and just the the fact. Um, I mean, I, I remember having a conversation with Larry Hyman about Jarwan, you know, several years ago now talking about, okay, so what's the shared innovation, right? And so at that point, we didn't really know. Um, we, didn't, we didn't even have enough lexicon for one of the languages, let alone having done all of this extra work to kind of compile uh, this kind of comparative Jarwan that we, we now have. But I mean, now we've done that. We've been looking at you know, proto Benway Congro, proto uh, Grassfields, you know, and even um, we're looking now at Tivoid languages, um, just to say, I mean, see that there really aren't any shared innovations. And in the one, that's why I point out tail, because we were kind of like, oh, wow, maybe this is the one, right? And then that even kind of falls apart. So, um, yeah. yeah. It's 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 uh in it's like an, it's a mystery and a puzzle all at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, great. Uh, uh, thank you. Does yeah. uh, seems like people are just fascinated by your talk, so they are uh, 
quiet. <laughs> so let's let's thank. Uh, well, that's what we'll say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's uh, Chris. Uh, uh, let's thank Chris uh, one more thank time. You. Thank you uh, so much about uh, enlightening us with uh, how this Chiron Bantu that was uh, underreported, understudied. Uh, works uh, with by working with the speakers so thank you. uh thank you and let's stop the recording at this point thank you.